Evening ladies and gents, my name is Simon Brown doing this evening's presentation. This evening we're talking about uh, turbulent markets. Um, and and I, I got a lot to say and a lot of it is, is, is broadly that, that markets will do crazy stuff from time to time. Uh, if I turn my doofer on, we can do that. Um, and, and that's our market from sort of, uh, it's about 13 months of, of, of market data. And there are a couple of things I want to draw from this. And the one is, I mean, are we bouncing around like crazy? Yeah. We're pretty much back to where we were in October, which is that sort of 41,000 level, although we have bounced off that. Um, and and we're, we're, we're down marginally. Uh, but we look at this, and, and it's a little bit scary. It certainly is. And we look at it, and those, every bar represents one day. And we look at that. And we start to worry about our portfolio, we start to worry about our ability to retire, we start to worry about whether we just didn't get completely conned by this whole idea of, of investing if perhaps our money wasn't better off under the bed. The key point that we need to always come back to is that investing is a long-term pursuit. When, I, you know, when people say to me they want to, they want to invest, they, 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 timelines, to me if, if your time view is less than three or five years, ignore the stock market. Just, just go away. It's, it's got to be a minimum of three or five years. And if you're looking at decades, you've got a significantly better chance of ultimately succeeding. Uh, what I mean by succeeding? Well, create wealth. That's what we're trying to do. So we need to constantly come back at that. So Monday evening when I was, I, I actually got on an airplane on Monday, so I missed much of the fun in our market. Um, and I was sitting in my, in my room Monday evening and I hauled up, updated my charts and I was looking at that and then I was fiddling around and I discovered something I'd never seen in my entire life. I've been, I've been in the markets for, for, for 30 plus years, actively for 20 plus years um, and I'd never ever seen uh, that chart there. That is an annual chart of the top 40. So every dot references one year. So we go to 96, 7, 8, 9, 2000 and so it goes on. An annual chart. I, I didn't know my software could do it. I've seen daily, I've seen weekly, I've seen monthly, I've never seen annually. It tells us one very, very clear thing. Man, markets go up. There are exceptions. There's a down year, 2008. Uh, there's a down year, 2010, only just, just down. Uh, 97, 98 were down years. Uh, 2001 was a down year. Five of them in a 21-year period. We get completely inaminated with the short-term nature of it. And the reason we do... It's really very, very, very simple. It's, 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 it's the media. It's people like me chirping on TV and Twitter and, 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 and the blogs and everything else that, that forces us to, to zoom in on the market. But in truth, if we zoom in, I mean, there's this year. So we're slightly down year to date. This chart is as of close on Tuesday, so the 25th. So we are slightly down year to date. But if we zoom in on it, that little line is significantly less scary than that. And it's broadly the same thing. And that's what we've got to keep on coming back to. And this was a, a tweet from Kevin Rose. He's actually a, a VC angel investor in the, in the, in the US. But in his comment, if, you know, if you're more than 10 years away from retirement and you invest like a normal human being, um, and disclaimer, we don't all, and we'll touch on that in a moment. But if we kind of like investing like normal human beings, Monday was nothing. And if we take it a step further, I mean, even 2008, which was a spooky year, make no bones about it, but even 2008, big picture, yeah, worst down year since, uh, worst down year since about the 20s. If we go back to even 87, um, market crashed 22% in one day in October, but the actual return for the year was only 13% negative. So that was at about 27% down, absolutely the worst year ever. And if you were sitting at that point there instead of that point there, it's a little more spooky. Point is, markets do crazy things in the short term. What are we trying to do? We're trying to create wealth. What's the, the best secret to wealth if there is a secret? It's about time. The more time we have, the easier it is. My niece and nephew, who are respectively five and seven years old, will be rich. And, and I, when I say rich, I don't mean Warren Buffett or Johan Rupert rich. I mean, you know, richer than, 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 than their parents. Will be rich simply because they would have been invested for decades because I've been buying them ETFs since they were born. Um, and it's the time that's going to be that key process. And that's why, to me, that is the most important chart as an investor we're ever going to see. It's the one that says to us, in the short term, there is noise. There is a huge amount of it. But that noise is largely meaningless. 
So just some more stats, uh, end of the world and stuff. And, and this is one of my favorite charts. It comes from a website called valuewalk.com. And he updates it every so often. Um, if you want a reason to be scared, there are reasons aplenty. Yeah, I could have done a presentation an hour long telling you why you should be scared of the market. And there are plenty. And my sources on this chart, I mean, we've got uh, Forbes telling us about double dip recessions. We've got New York Times telling us about double dip recessions. You will note that that's a year and a half later and there's still no double dip recession. We've got the Wall Street Journal telling us that we're in recession. You note they've stopped the double dip because after a while it's no longer a double dip, it's just another recession. Uh, we've got Time Magazine talking about a recession. Uh, we've got the uh, Zero Hedge. Okay, now Zero Hedge, if it moves, it's bad as far as he's concerned. Telling us that they're heading for another recession. That was June of last year. We've got Forbes Magazine again, who apparently forgot about that article and have come back. And they've got 23 compelling reasons why we're heading, not for a recession anymore, that's passe. We're heading for a market crash. One of their reasons... Oh, and I should have printed it because I'm not going to remember it. One of their reasons is a triple roof hooded witch. <laughs> I'm now I'm being completely dinkingly serious. This is apparently a chart pattern that if you see it, one in 500 times it works. The other 499 times you look silly because you're talking about triple hooded witches or whatever the nonsense is. There is always a good reason to be scared of the market. You're either scared because it's too high, you're scared because it's too low, you're scared because there's data. Uh, I saw a blog post today, a local one, about how the RAND has disconnected from reality. Because we've got that GDP data out and, and we're halfway to a technical recession. Uh, technical recession, two negative quarters of GDP. We've had the first one. If, we get, if this quarter is negative, we're in our second. Um, and they're saying, but this makes no sense, but the RAND has strengthened since that data came out. That's the point, is that there's information and there's stock markets and the correlation is frankly fairly weak. And, and we will go into recessions. And, you know, at, at the beginning of, of 2008, which was you know, the worst year we've had in, in almost 100 years, well at that point almost 80 years, um, there were lots of people talking about recession and end of the world and crisis and everything else. But there always is. Every year there is. And of course when it happens, they will tell you that they were right. They will find the clip from when they were on CNBC and they will put it on their website. They will, for the rest of their life, use that as their reason to exist. There's a gentleman called uh, Pretcher, and I forget his first name, but he predicted, and I use inverted commas, the crash of 1987. His claim to fame is still that he predicted the crash of 1987. It's like, okay, what about the 98 one and the 2001 one and the 2008? And what about the, the bull markets in between? All he's ever predicted is the crash of 1987. And when you go back and read it, he was predicting the crash of 1987 from 1981. <laughs> you know the theory about a broken clock? Well, it's right twice a day. Uh, so his claim to fame, and in, in now he's up to 35 years of marketing, is that once after five years he got something right and he still goes back to it. And I'm not saying that there won't be recessions. I'm not saying there won't be market crashes. I can guarantee you we will have both. And we will have lots of them. I remember I bought my first shares um, <laughs> October, uh, October 15, 1987. The market crashed October 19, 1987. And I thought that's pretty cool. I thought, you know what, the market crashes, get it out of the way. And we're done. Because my grandfather always taught me there'd been two market crashes, 1929, 1969. And then we had the crash in 87, and I thought, this is brilliant, market crashes, it's going to be a bull market for the rest of my investing life. Then 98 came, shook me a bit, emerging market crisis. Then the dot-com bubble bust, that was a little weird. The, you know what? Markets crash. I've probably got another dozen to go in my lifetime. If we live in fear of them, we're missing out. If we live in fear of them, what are we doing? We're, we're, we're selling at that point right down here in 2004, maybe 2005, and then when it does crash, do we buy at the bottom? No, because we're scared. We're just missing out. What we've got to say is they will come, and if anything, they're opportunities. And if we're correctly positioned, then we'll do well. And, and, and as I said, I mean, Monday, and I've got the slide up, uh, on Twitter on Monday, I, everyone was calling it Black Monday. I said, no, no, Monday was not Black Monday. Monday was overcast Monday. There wasn't even a threat of showers. It was just slightly overcast. Um, 
the point being is, if we are positioned correctly, crashes, they're not fun. I mean, they will ruin your day, but that's it. You know, if, if a market crash is threatening your retirement, you're doing it wrong. If a market crash is, is going to destroy your wealth, you're doing it wrong. Market crash should just be one of those things that comes along, makes a big mess, and passes, and it's something you can tell your children and your grandchildren about. And your grandchildren are going to be like, you're talking about the crash again, aren't you? You know, the boring stuff that we keep on going back to. Um, so, and, and there, this is the S&P 500. I mean, that there is, is Monday, you know, and, and the lead up to it. If you watch CNBC, if you, I mean, if you watch any of the channels, if you, if you read any of the blogs, you would kind of expect for the hype and hysteria that we are sort of somewhere, I don't know, maybe underground, the market has done so incredibly poorly. Again, okay, I go back to that. Even just over the last year, we've done about 6% over 12 months. Not lacquer, but not even close to being worth worrying about. Um, Here's another one. So this is, uh, again, uh, this is again S&P 500. Uh, the data doesn't come out very well, but this goes back to the 1940s. And what we've got is the, ra the rallies that go up, which are the green bits, and those red bits that below are those market crashes. Those things that we are so scared of, and there have been, what, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13, although some of them have been more modest than others, some at like 12%, uh, some at 42%. But all of those red things that are coming below are what are terrifying us. We're missing the picture. Frankly, ignore those horrible red things. What's important are those lovely green parts that make us the money. No crash has ever taken us back to zero. We are, as we stand right now, with one exception, uh, no, not with one exception, with one major exception, every single market in the world is above their pre-crash level from their previous crash. In other words, when we crashed in 2008, markets have exceeded those levels. There's one exception. There's a couple. Greece, yeah, we know Greece. Uh, Russia, yeah, yeah, Russia. Brazil, yeah, yeah. Uh, Japan. So Japan's all-time high was 1984. Uh, 31 years later, they're at 20 odd thousand, and that index peaked at about 40,000. Japan's either the theory that proves, you know, that the, that's so bad it proves the theory. Or, I mean, if Japan is our future, then really it's about bottled water, pumpkin seeds, and bullets. Because we're going to Mad Max. And I have, well, I don't have bullets. I have bottled water and pumpkin seeds at home, just in case. A, a bull market is nice. It's fun. It, it's great to, to watch the people on, on CNBC and Bloomberg jumping up and down and getting all excited about all-time highs. But what sells the front page of a newspaper? Crash. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. If the, if the Natal Mercury or the Daily News have a headline that says, new high on the market, ah, no one buys that. If they run a headline that says crash, they can't print enough. That's why, although the crashes, the red bits are, in this chart, frankly, irrelevant and immaterial, they are what dominates the news cycle. They, more than that, they what dominate our thinking. They what dominate our fears. What actually matters is that this thing goes up. Not in a straight line, but make no bones, it goes up. I mean, and there it is. This is the local one, but it's going up. And I, 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 I remember all the crashes in here. So there's the emerging market crisis. Uh, there's the dot com. Um, and at the time, I mean, that emerging market crisis was terrifying. The theory was Standard Bank had a hundred million dollar in the days when a hundred million was a lot of money. <clears throat> now, hundred million is like petty cash. They had a hundred million dollar with uh, Russia, and Russia was threatened to default. And the fear was that Russia would default, Standard Bank would go bust, the other banks would collapse, and we would break off and sink into the ocean. No, it was positively scary. I mean, I, one of the articles I remember reading was um, trying to convince people not to go and draw money from the bank, which of course means you go and draw money from the bank. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it was that level of fear. And, uh, well, frankly, boring. I mean, the dot-com bust wasn't so bad for us. We had a lot of dot-com stocks, but we weren't the NASDAQ. Um, and, and even the NASDAQ, which peaked at 5,000, has subsequently, 14 years later, exceeded those levels again. But we didn't get the run up. Understand, the 1999, the NASDAQ stock index doubled in value. So, yeah, it took a, a, a fair pounding from it. Um, 
That there was probably my first crash which didn't completely panic me in 2008. And frankly, I can't wait for the next crash. Because I think after having experienced four or five of them, I actually know kind of like what to do and how to do it and stuff like that. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So, beautiful pictures. And the red bits, if anything, are giving us opportunity. They certainly shouldn't dominate our thinking. And they will. And the media will hop on about them. And your friends who know that you invested in the stock market will either sort of like nudge you in the ribs and say, ho, oh, oh, you're poor today, aren't you? Or, or say to their other friends, we, we think he might need a loan, but be careful. Um, that's fine. You know what? Let, let them snicker away. We're actually the, focusing on the green bits. The noise will not go away. That's fine. They, they're welcome to their noise. We're smarter than that noise. That's what actually matters in the process. So as I was saying, you know, everyone was telling us on Monday, and again, it's the, it's the media. And what does the media need? They need eyeballs. They need clicks. And the best way to get clicks is these big, blurry headlines. You know, uh, instead of... So, so when I publish that, that, that chart, that, that annual chart, I can't just say, you know, annual chart to top 40. I have to say a chart you... The most important chart you've never seen to hope that I can convince you because there's so much attention for your, for your, for your time, for your eyeball, for your reading, for your click on the link. That we, they've got to hype it. So on Monday, the, the hashtag that was trending was Black Monday. It's like, no, folks. This was, Black Monday was 22.61%, uh, 19 October 1987. That was Black Monday. And that was really, really bad. My dad, Arthur Shares, went from 55 cents to 12 cents. That was bad. This past Monday was overcost. We ended up losing 3%. At the worst, we were down 6 that day in October 1987, worst day we've ever had on the JSC. An important point is that the JSC and stock markets around the world have adjusted systems to try and prevent a repeat of that. And broadly we could say it worked because as much as 2008, the top to bottom was a lot more. We never had the sort of days like this. Our worst day in 2008 was about 8.5% down. And what they do is if the market falls by a certain percentage, exchanges around the world, JSC, London, New York, Tokyo, they shut the market for half an hour so everyone can calm down. I don't know about you, but that's probably going to lead to panic. But nonetheless, that's the theory. If when they open half an hour later, the market falls another whole bunch, they shut it for an hour, which means everyone's going to come back drunk, right? The market's closed for an hour. What are you, you're going to the pub, for goodness sake. If when you come back from the pub and the market continues to fall, they shut it and they say, come back tomorrow. If we actually take it to the nuance and we look at the JSC, we go into what we call volatility auctions. And we have it all the time. Every market open starts with, a, with an auction. Every market close ends with an auction. But in between, during the course of a day, if a stock moves by a certain percentage, it goes into volatility auction. So it's actually been managed on a stock-by-stock -stock basis. So, for example, when Anglo-America cancelled their dividend in 2009 and the stock fell 16%, it went into volatility, it fell 5%, it goes into volatility auction. In other words, trading stops, we do an auction process, it, re it restarts again 10 minutes later, and then, I mean, Anglo-America then fell another 5 and then another 5 and then another 5 but kind of to try and step it and slow it down. So are we going to have a 22% crash in a single day? I think not. But are we going to have markets that lose large percentages? Guaranteed. Absolutely guaranteed. And someone out there will tell you exactly the when and where's. Mm. Check what they're driving. If it isn't that new, you know, two and a half million rand Lamborghini, then I'm suspect of their ability to predict the market as well. What do we know about the future? Two things. It'll happen and we have no idea what will happen. A lot of people will tell us they can read the future, that they have some magic, something or other. Everyone has the same ability to read the future. Zero. We have nothing. And there are, there's a chap in America called Mahendra who will give you stock tips based on astrology. I mean, why not? It's as good as anything else in a sense. Of course, he's still working on his website. So if, again, if they were any good, he would have made so much money, he would have bought Greece. <clears throat> That's the key point. If Monday caused you a large amount of stress, you're doing something wrong. And that wrong could be many things. That wrong could be that you're watching the news. You've got a long-term portfolio. What happens minute to minute, day by day is immaterial. It could be that you're 
badly positioned that you're holding some, some dodgy shares. And when I say some dodgy shares, you know exactly which ones they are. They'll be different for everybody. But that little junior platinum miner that you bought at 60 rand because it was going to a billion and it's now trading at 12 cents. And it went from 12 cents to 2 cents and you know exactly the one I'm talking about. And we've all got them. It's different for everybody. I, I, for the first time in my life, have what I call a clean portfolio because my dodgy share, which I bought 20,000 rands worth in 1996, delisted in 2012 and I got 54 rand back. We've all got that share. Best part is, I don't have it anymore. It's gone. It finally got delisted. It is away from me. It no longer causes me trouble. But if, if Monday caused stress, there's, there's something we need to change. Because Monday will happen again. And if we're getting stressed by volatile markets, that, there's no upside to that. We need to make sure that we can find ourselves in a situation where market volatility is at best benign, uh, uh, at worst benign rather, at best it's opportunity. So what do we do and how do we manage that process? And in short, what to hold? So a couple of things we never sell. The first one we never sell is our core ETFs. I talk about core and satellite portfolios. We're at the middle of your portfolio, you have exchange traded funds. And there are a couple of reasons why we have that core of exchange traded funds in the middle. Firstly, because they give you market return and they remove the biggest risk to your portfolio. The biggest risk to your portfolio, it's not Janet Yellen, Zero Hedge, or anybody else. It's you, it's me, it's us as an individual. We bought something that we kind of hope, wish we'd never bought. And we bought something that went completely and absolutely the other way. We bought uh, Lonman at 160 and still own it at 6. And I'm hoping like heck it gets back to 160. And Lonman's not getting back to 16, never mind 160. So we've always got that core. What that core also does is it, it gives us the market, but it gives us a level of, 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 of I don't want to say confidence, but a level of, of comfort when days like Monday happen. Because did my ETFs go down on Monday? You bet you. Well, though, oddly enough, my American ETFs, the, the, the DB trackers, did quite well because the RAND got killed and the market got killed and they kind of evened out. But what that ETF does is it means that you're just taking the market's down 3%, you're down 3%. The problem is when the market's down 3% and you're down 20%, then you're doing something fundamentally wrong. So those core of ETFs, which you never sell. I had a bunch of people for, uh, contacting me on Monday, should I sell my long-term ETFs? No chance. Particularly not if they're in a tax-free tax savings account. I mean, you can. In a tax-free savings account, there's no tax in. But now what you're starting to say is you're taking a long-term investment for you. You bought an ETF that you plan to ride forever. And now you're trying to time the market on a daily basis. I mean, you haven't just become a trader. You've become an incredibly short-term trader. The ETFs, they go in and you ignore them. You know, and, and there are issues, and we'll touch on it a bit. You know, as you start to, 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 to enter into retirement, that your risk profiles change and the ETFs you hold will change. I get that. You're looking less at capital appreciation. You're looking more at income distribution. Yes, absolutely that case. But those ETFs you hold. My sister, who knows nothing about the stock market except her brother does something in the stock market. I used to, when I used to, when I ran SA Warrants, I told her I work at Warrants. She said, what's that? I said, I arrest people. For years, she thought I was an undercover cop. <laughs> um, I get there on, on, on Monday evening, go out for dinner, and she says to me, should I be selling my shares? I'm like, you don't own shares, you own ETFs. Should I be selling my ETFs? Why? Oh, because the man on the wireless, it's like, turn the wireless off. <laughs> So those core ETFs, we hold them. Now, you know, what is not a core ETF? A, a, if you've got ETFs that are giving you exposure to biotech, which would, it would have to be a US list if you don't have it locally, a, a biotech ETF is not core. What is a core ETF? It's a broad basket of shares. It's a top 40 ETF. It's one of the Deutsche Bank X trackers that track entire markets. Um, it's a property ETF. It's the, the ABSA Givies or the, the core shares top 50 or something like that. If you've got a resource ETF or something, and you're starting to get a little beyond what I consider to be core holdings. Core holdings are vanilla 
broad base. There might be some, some debt ETFs in there, either the Prefex or bond shares or something like that. Um, if, you, if you're holding an oil ETF, well, then maybe you should be selling that because that's not, what I'm, that's not core, that's peripheral to my mind. But if you're holding a Satrix 40 or a, a BBET40 or a PropTrax 10 or a DBX, whichever DBX, you sold that one day when you need money, when you're old and, and, and doddery. Uh, and you think, oh, I need to, I don't know, we were talking about buying a car. So, you know, there's a new Maserati coming out next week. You think, <laughs> I want the Maserati. So what do you do? You go off and you sell some ETFs and you buy the Maserati. Top tip, eh? we buy the Maserati when we're old, not when we're young. No, because firstly, it's probably going to kill us. So I'm going to wrap it around a lamppost almost certainly. But uh, more, more, more than that, uh, cars are terrible. They're, they're not investments. They're just terrible things that cost vast amount of money. So those we hold. We say, you know what? We like them. They're cool. They're core. We sell them at some point, but not because of market movement, but because of our needs in terms of cash flow and living expenses and the like. And if you're young, you're looking at decades and decades of time. And when I say young, seeing as I'm now technically in middle age, um, when I say young, anyone under 75 is young, hey, just for the record. <laughs> Which I hope, if it didn't include all of you, let's make it 80. I don't know. <laughs> 85. I can do 85. <laughs> Whatever that was, was a brave, that was a brave comment. But <laughs> and you keep your outstanding stocks. So what are outstanding stocks? And I will tell you what my outstanding stocks are, and we can talk about your outstanding stocks in the Q&A. My outstanding stocks, Richmond, Capitech, uh, Discovery, Famous Brands, uh, and then my mind, uh, ShopRite, Woolies. Um, these are outstanding stocks. So I'll do the list again because you're frantically writing. If you go to, si if you go to simonbrown.co, my portfolio is published. Um, Capitech, uh, 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 Richmond, Discovery, uh, Famous Brands, Woolies, ShopRite. These are outstanding companies. These are companies that are global leaders, the exception being Capitech and Famous Brands. But if they were big enough, they will lead the globe. You know, what Famous Brands does in terms of operating margin of, 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 in ex of over 20%. There is no fast food company in the world that has more than 2,000 outlets that has an operating margin over 10%. Famous Brands has 20. They are globally outstanding. What Discovery has done with Vitality. We know that Vitality is brilliant. Some of you may use it. I ran the numbers and the numbers were terrible. So instead of joining Vitality, I bought Discovery shares because all those Vitality holders are being ripped. But hey, that's brilliant for my profit margin. Vitality is brilliant. How do we know this? Because John Hancock, one of the biggest insurers in America, comes to Discovery and says, can we license your product? And you know what they did before they came and asked to license it? They spent a year trying to reverse engineer it, didn't they? They didn't want to pay license fees. They looked at this and said, we'll work out how they do it. We'll do it ourselves. A year later, they're like, ah, you know what, Discovery? How about we just give you money and you give us the secret sauce? Outstanding company. Richmond, outstanding company. Any company that can sell a watch for one million pounds has to be outstanding. You know what their operating margin is? 65%. You know what their cost to manufacture a million pound watch is? About three or four thousand pounds. That's not markup. That is highway robbery. You know what? Do you want to own the robbers, right? Capitech can make you a bank account for five rand a month. And they make more profit on a five rand bank account than the big four banks make on a hundred rand bank account. Capitech, cost of income 35%. Big banks, cost of income 55%. Capitech's account is five rand, the banks have got their cheap accounts are 100, 104, 110. If you want to be fancy and get a platinum card, two, three, four hundred rand. That's an outstanding company. Woolies can take a piece of meat, which is just frankly a piece of meat, wrap it in four pieces of plastic, put an expiry date, which is about 12 minutes away, and sell it to you for three times the price what Checkers sells it. That's an outstanding company. I know because I'm in the queue with my piece of meat. And then I get home and my wife says, you know what, I was just a checkers and they've also got some cow. 
and their cows like a whole lot less. But my wife's a vegetarian, so she won't buy the cow, so I've got to buy the cow, and I shop. So our household is very clever. We, well, it's not clever, it's a rule in our house. I shop at Woolies, my wife shops at uh, uh, Checkers, no one shops at Pick and Pay or Spa. We don't own shares in Pick and Pay and Spa. We don't shop there. These are other outstanding companies. Are they going to have tough times? You betcha. Are they going to see their share prices fall? Yeah. Are they going to see earnings at times under pressure? Guaranteed. Are they going to outlive us? Yes. And are they going to be outstanding? Yes. Hilton Tarrant uh, tweeted today his local Woolies. They managed to double the shelf space for food in two weeks without losing a single hour of trade. Man, that is just terrifyingly efficient. Because what would you normally do? If it was my store, it's simple. I would find a quiet period. I would shut it down for... Well, if they tell me it's going to take two weeks, it'll take four. So I'll shut my store for four weeks. I'll still have all my costs, but I'll have no income. But you know what? That's fine because they'll have double the space. Not willies. I mean, we're assuming that they came in at midnight and like worked for six hours. They doubled the retail space in that store without losing a single hour of trade. That is outstanding. Notwithstanding, they rip me off from the meat. And then they make me eat it in 12 minutes. <laughs> There's two things we always obey, hey? The, on your clothing, the sign that says dry clean only. I mean, I'll, I'll put anything in a washing machine until it says dry clean only, and then we obey that. And the woolies eat by date. Man, we, we obey that eat by date. I mean, is it true? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a scientist of any sort, but man, I obey that date. So we keep our outstanding companies forever. There's an exception. Sometimes outstanding companies stop being outstanding. For 20 or 30 years, Pick and Pay was the outstanding retailer in South Africa. In the late 90s, they started to lose their way. And we could see them lose their way. And I stress, this is hindsight. I wasn't a shareholder at that point. I wasn't at any point. You see them lose their way because their margins start to shrink. They stop spending on the business. They start losing market share to, in the case of Pick, excuse me, Pick and Pay, they were losing market share to, to, to uh, ShopRite and Checkers. And some companies will lose their way. Uh, you know, pick and pay, it wasn't even a change of management. It was still the Ackerman family who were running it. And then they will try and come back again. But those stocks, we hold them. And we hold them until they do one day perhaps maybe lose their way. And in many cases, they may not. For many years in this country, the best bank to hold was Nedbank. And then 15 years ago, they lost their way. And the worst bank to hold was Nedbank. And recently, it's done nicely. But you always want outstanding. You don't want winners. You don't want great. You don't want wonderful. You want outstanding companies. Companies that you could put anywhere on planet Earth and they will whip it. So we hold them. I call it swan. Sleep well at night. Those companies that you hold and that you don't ever give it a second thought. My shop rights have been as high as 220 rand three years ago, now they're 160. Their, their, their growth went from 25-30% a year down to 8 or 9% a year. That doesn't bother me. YT Besson, shop rights spends uh, a billion rand on, sorry, two and a half billion rand on security and generators. And they still have an operating margin of 6%. Walmart globally, has a, sorry, Walmart globally has an operating margin of 1.5%. And they don't spend 2.5 billion rand on, 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 on security and, and, and generators. Okay, so if we took Whitey and put him in Walmart, Walmart would make money. Tons of it. But we keep him for shop right. So there's companies which, when you, you, know, you go to bed at night, you can't sleep. In my case, it's, ugh, we are in Durban, you all can sympathize with me. The sharks. Man, they keep me stressed. <laughs> you want those sleep well at night. You want that portfolio. When Monday came out around and the market was going crazy, your first thought was, hey, hey, some of these outstanding companies are going to be cheap. You know the problem with outstanding companies? <coughs> they don't get cheap. So what did Richmond do? Oh, went down to 100. Lost about half a percent. Capitec went up. That should be illegal. No, okay, I mean, it was like four cents. But Capitec went up. Why? Outstanding company. ShopRite middled along. 
the outstanding companies don't collapse. The ones that were collapsing were the uh, Lonman Avenge. You know, I pick a miner, any miner. I pick a constructor, any constructor. So what do we buy? First point, don't rush it. Everyone on Monday. Ah, let's buy, let's buy. Now in truth, if you bought it at the right time on Monday, you've made money. But the big thing was, Monday is a once in a lifetime opportunity. No. Monday is a once in an August opportunity. There will be September and there will be a real market crash. The, the once in a lifetime opportunity is a media thing to make us click or read their article. But more than that, <clears throat> what it's doing is making us do irrational things. Making us jump in, making us think that if we don't do this, we are missing once in a lifetime opportunity. There are seldom, honestly, once in a lifetime opportunities that come along in our life. I'm racking my brain to try and think of one. There must, I mean, there are seldom happens. And when they do happen, when 2008 happens, so what did I do? Market crashes, so I buy in June. Crashes more, I buy in September. Crashes more, I buy in December. Crashes more, I buy in March. Finally, that was the bottom. A 3% down day is not once in a lifetime opportunity. It's just a volatile day in the market. But do know what attracts you. Do know what your outstanding stocks are and know what price you pay. So I know Richmond. If Richmond goes below 90 Rand, man, I'm, I'm pawning my niece and nephew to buy Richmond shares. Not because I'm saying it can't go lower, but because by my metric, Richmond 90 bucks is an absolute steal. Remember a couple of years ago, Richmond collapsed to 40. Again, not a once in a lifetime, but at that point you needed to know that Richmond was a stock that you thought outstanding and 40 Rand was a price you thought was outstanding. And on Monday, of all the stocks I like, all of my outstanding companies, none of them got to within 10% of prices that I like. So I, I didn't buy anything. I bought ETFs on Tuesday because Tuesday was the 25th and the 25th of every month I buy ETFs. But know what those stocks are. Don't go knee-jerk. Don't respond. The people tweeting me and saying, what should I be buying? And then people see MTN's fallen the most. And they say, do you think MTN's cheap at 168? My honest answer, I thought MTN was cheap at 205. Turns out I was wrong then too. But that fear of missing out makes us do silly knee-jerk things, makes us buy Richmond at 100 Rand, which is not cheap. It's not bad, it's not crazy expensive. Discovery, I want to buy more discoveries, but I want to pay less than 120. Ideally, I want to pay 110. And those price points I pay will change. As earnings pick up, the price points pick up. So when we chat in a year, Richmond is no longer a 90 Rand, Richmond will be a 100 or 110, whatever the case may be. But it's important to know which are the stocks that you, that you really, really want to own that are outstanding and how much are you prepared to pay for them. So what I add, Aspen, Naspass and MTN. Uh, Naspass, no. <clears throat> I think Kurspec is outstanding. I don't know about Naspass. And I'm not saying it isn't. I just, I'm not sure. Uh, Aspen, again, uh, in a, uh, is, is Stephen Sard absolutely yes? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, because every time I criticize him, I meet his mother at the coffee shop at... <laughs> At Mus uh, not at Musgrave, at, at Mitchell Park, and she gives me help. So, um, Aspen's really, I don't, I, I've never, dr I have an issue with, with healthcare, and I can touch on it in the Q&A perhaps, but Aspen maybe. MTN is the one that perhaps bothers me the most. And look, I hold MTN. Um, problem with MTN, what's their strength? Ultimately, they're data providers. I changed, I went off contract, bought myself a cell phone, and used a different provider. I went to all of the four different providers, one per month. So I just ported. I went to. I started at Vodacom, where I'd been for 20 years, 25 years. I then went to MTN. I went to Cell C, and I went to Telcom, um, just trying out the different networks. The one I liked most was Cell C, because my phone never rang. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, I did it, and then I went back to MTN because I need, <clears throat> I need good signal quality and good uh, uh, data quality in three locations. Here, VNA Waterfront. Oh, and then two in Joburg, one at the JC building and one at my house. So I need good data at four places. Um, and MTN met, those, met the requirement. The other networks didn't. But they're just data. They've got to be clever. I don't have a problem with that. You, they're your utility. Utility is a beautiful thing. Water, electricity, we live with it. But they've got to be clever enough to make me sticky. 
and they haven't yet got that. But it's not that they aren't thinking about it. They will perhaps get there in time. So have that list. Know what it is. I mean, you know, whether it's a piece of paper or whether it sits in your head or whatever the case may be. So that when Monday happens, if you're so inclined, you can log on and say, well, okay, uh, let's see where the shares I think outstanding are. In my case, I did that. I flew at about 2 o'clock, so at about at the airport at about half past 12, logged on, had a look. Yeah, nothing particularly thrilling. And I kind of knew that because I've got alerts set on all the shares. So if they trade at a certain price, I get an SMS. But I was thinking, you know, maybe my price is 90 and they're at 90.50. I'll pay up 50 cents. But none of them were even within jumping distance, so I did nothing. But then what do we sell? And the selling, the important point with the selling is not to sell on Monday. The point is to have a portfolio that can withstand Monday. So what happens is at the bottom of the market in 2008, we've got a decimated portfolio and it's full of all sorts of stuff, right? It's full of some quality, it's full of some rubbish that we should have sold but didn't sell. And then as the bull market happens, we do two things. We build on the quality, but we also buy some second tier. And in truth, we buy some rubbish as well, but we buy some other stocks. And in a bull market, that's fine. The bull market hides those shares. But then at some point, we've got to start saying to ourselves, hmm. So what I've been doing this year is cleaning, out, is cleaning up my portfolio. And, and I'm not finished. And, and there's a couple of stocks that are on my, on my chopping block that I, I've either been selling gently or I need to give some more thought to. Um, but uh, stocks that I, I had a position in platinum, gone. And I took a small loss on that, 16%, no problem. I had a position in clover made about 80% over five years, which is not particularly spectacular. Um, is Clover an outstanding company? No. It's a great company. It's a good company. It's a wonderful It's not outstanding. Gone. My Standard Bank shares, almost certainly going to go. <laughs> I'm at a JC event, so I can say that. When I'm at a Standard Bank event, I can't say that. <laughs> um, you know, so, so I've been cleaning out my portfolio, and that's what we need to do. And, and particularly, why am I doing it now? Because we're five years into a bull market, which means we're closer to the top than we are the bottom. And, and, and not that Monday is going to come, but that we are, we, we're going to be having a bear market, and we are closer to the next one than we were the last one, which means the next bear market is at some point in the next five years, which means my predicting is zero, but that's fine. So clean out that portfolio. I spoke a moment ago about that stock, and you've all got one, and if you haven't, then, then you've probably sold it. You probably bought it as a, on a hot tip or a quick make money in a hurry, and it tanked. And every time you log on to your, to your, to your online account, it stares at you. It doesn't stare at you, it taunts you. It's like, ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know which one I'm talking about, right? You are waiting for the day it gets back to the price you paid and you're selling it. Here's the good news. You can sell it. The bad news, it is not getting back to the price you paid. My brainwares, which I paid one rand for in 1996, got delisted at split adjusted half a cent. 20 years later. That was the one for me. That was the one for me. Every, the best part about that was I, it, it, I bought it so far ago, long ago, it wasn't in my online share trading account. I had a physical paper certificate. So you've got that stock. When I say that stock that shouldn't be in your portfolio, you all have that stock. So here's the deal. Tomorrow, log on, sell it. What price do you get? Does not matter. There's two things you're doing. You're giving yourself closure. I hate the word, but it's the right word. You're also making it easier that when you log onto your portfolio, there isn't the stock that's taunting you. And you know what? When the market crashes, it's just going to crash further. And then once you've sold it, what do you do? You delete it. You never look at it again. And when the person comes on TV and is talking about that stock, you mute it. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You delete it from your life. You make it gone. And you start to clean that portfolio. <clears throat> you look at those second tiers. So, my Clovers, bad company? No. Outstanding? No. Boom, you're gone. Standard Bank, bad company? No. Biggest bank in Africa, blah, blah, blah. Outstanding company? 
They're an old legacy bank. Capitex outstanding. Standard Bank's the bank. Boom. On their way. And we need to go through our list of shares. And we do it particularly at this point because we will pick up the rubbish, and not rubbish, we'll pick up the second tiers during that bull market and we'll make money off them. But when we're closer to the top than the bottom, we've got to start saying to ourselves, which are the ones here that, ah, they're nice, but I can better use the money. And then you take the money and you buy the stocks that are outstanding. Yeah, I mean, I would say PSG is outstanding. I mean, what have they got? They've got Capitec, um, they've got uh, uh, Kuro, they've got PSG, um, they've got Consult, which is a lovely business, and then they've got Zida, which is a lovely business if you're PSG, not if you're Zida, because Zida pays chronic management fees to PSG. You never want to own Zida. The management fees are, are, are an absolute ripoff. You want to own PSG. And what they do is allocation of capital. And watch what PSG does, hey? Yanni Maton and all the PSG folks, at the bottom, they're buying. At the top, they're selling. So what do they do at the top? They do a rights issue. That's selling shares. And at the bottom, they do a share buyback. Just follow Maton. No one knows that stock better than him. If Maton's buying, or, the, or if PSG's buying their own shares, you should be too. So those second tiers, they may be good, but they're not good enough. And, and then, of course, we've got the third tiers and the rubbish stocks and the horrible stocks and the like. And, 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 and I mean, they must just go. They, they must just get, get moved. And then cyclical stocks. Cyclical stocks, construction, single commodity producers, they have their day in the sun. Yes. But if they're struggling now, imagine what happens when the market goes pear-shaped. And don't tell me gold's going to save us. If it is, I want to see you eat a gold bar. Then I'm impressed. So mining and commodities, and I've got three. Uh, I've got South 32 because I've got Billiton, and I've got uh, Sassel. And, and I've always said, you know what, Sassel's different um, because oil's different. I was wrong about that. Sassel's different because it's chemical more than oil, but I'm giving it thought. Um, yeah, you think that's a weak argument. <laughs> I've suffered it too. Okay, you suffered it too. Hey, um, and Billiton... I've always said, you know what, you want diverse commodity miners and you want the best in the world and Billiton is the best in the world and they are diverse, but there's every chance I'm just wrong. And, and South 32 is on the chopping block. I'm just waiting for someone to come and take it over, but it looks like that's not going to happen either. But they're going to get even especially hard hit. I mean, if they're struggling to make money now and they've got to do rights issues and life's really tough, etc., etc. And I'm not saying you must rush out and panic and tomorrow morning, five minutes past nine, sell every, 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 every stock you don't like. You know, we've, and maybe we haven't got time. Maybe those messages from my PA telling me the world just ended or the US has crashed 30%. But there's a process. The crash could be tomorrow, it could be, it could be in, in five years. Start looking at it and, and, and get what are the ones we don't like? Should we sell them? What prices can we get? But the cyclicals get especially hard. The construction stocks. Marion Roberts was 106 at the highs in 2008 and is now, I don't know what it is. Uh, Anglo Platinum was 1600 and is now whatever it might be. Um, and so the list goes on. Lonman was 160 and now it's 6. Um, and going lower. Hey? Lonman and Avenge. I'm not sure that they survive. So find those stocks that are, are the second tiers. And, and you know, once we're through the crisis, which will pass and everything, yes, we pick them up again and we do this process again. When you're three, four years into a bull market, you start taking a hard look at your portfolio and saying, I've got my outstandings, but I've got those other ones that I perhaps shouldn't be having. Time to get rid of those. <clears throat> um, we can look at hedging. I'm not a fan of hedging. So what is a hedge? A hedge is the, a, a derivative product that makes you money when the market falls, which is lacquer. So the market falls and you lose money in your portfolio, but you make money in the hedge. But if you don't get your timing right, the market rises and you make money in your portfolio, but you lose money in your hedge. So you're locking yourself in a point. And there's always a scary story that why you should be hedging today. And if you had hedged at any point in the last five years, you're poorer for it any point in the last five years. That's not true. If you'd hedged in 4th of May this year and we hit an all-time high. So if you managed to pick that one day in the last five years, you've, you're, you're doing all right. So I don't do the hedging story. If you want to, you can take a warrant, which is basically an option, top SBT. It expires in April of next year, 60,000, so it is in the money. 
If the market falls, that warrant will depreciate in price. If the market rises, that warrant will lose value. It expires in April. If it is below 60,000 in April, there will be cash payout. If it's above 60,000, you will get nothing. So warrants options are very much like an insurance policy. I have a fairly simple view on insurance. Apart from a motor car um, and my house burning down, I don't bother with insurance. Because over a lifetime, I've got to get robbed a hell of a lot for me to beat the insurer. We know that because the insurers are in business. If it was possible for me to beat the insurer, we wouldn't have insurers. They would be bust. Um, th that's my view. And then, of course, you can do futures. So you can do stocks or indices, and you could do CFDs instead. So you could take a short position in the Aussie future. You could take short positions in your heavy-weighted stocks that you've got. But I'm saying, what are we doing with hedging? We're trying to protect ourselves in the short term. Nice. But what are we actually doing as investors? We're focusing on the long term. So we're mixing our thinking. Long-term investor, short-term protection. No. What you want is long-term investor, long-term protection. How do you get long-term protection? Buy outstanding companies. Much better. And then when the market falls, they get cheap. But when the market rallies, you make money. Rather than if you're hedged and the market rallies, you lose money. What's your costs on them? And your timing needs to be, with an option, your timing's less critical. With futures or CFDs, your timing needs to be fairly critical. If you're doing futures, CFDs, remember that there's a day-to-day -day cash uh, uh, process. So if the market goes up, you lose money. You have to pay the money today. Whereas with the warrant, you buy the warrant, and that's it. You've paid your money. You can only lose 100%. <clears throat> no, if you lose 100%, it means our market is above 60,000 points in April. I'll take that any day. That's 30% above where we are right now. That would be quite chunky. We mean good Easter. Mm, very good Easter. So it's about quality. It's about knowing what we like. It's so that when the Mondays come, and they will, and when the days that are significantly worse than Monday come, and they will too, we can be calm and collect because we have a portfolio that we know and we love with full of outstanding companies because we also know what stocks we want to buy, we know where we want to buy them, and don't panic. None of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. When a market starts going down, we have no idea how low it will go. We know where it, it's not going to zero, but we don't know where it goes to. So when markets fall, as I said in 08, what I did, I mean, I bought every quarter. I just went in and bought, not because I thought it was bottom, but because I thought, yeah, now the quarter's just ended, market still falling, I'll buy myself some more of that. And my bad purchases that I did in that period are up 200% excluding dividends. But it was just a constant plan to know what I wanted. The prices were right. I mean, in 2008, any stock was, was at a good price. The prices were right. I knew what I wanted. Every quarter, went in, bought stocks, bought stocks. And they, for most of those quarters, they kept on falling. Finally, in March 09, they stopped falling and started to rally. And particularly with stocks like Woolies, like ShopRite, who do give us very few opportunities to buy them because they're outstanding. Discovery, Richmond, they're very seldom cheap. And certainly Monday was not cheap. They were slightly down unless you were Capitec. So, I mean, the point is, don't panic. If we're panicking... If it's causing us stress, we're not prepared, we're doing it wrong, we have a portfolio that is too high risk. This is a tweet that I put out pre-open on, on uh, Monday morning. And it's quite simply, if, if you're a trader, ignore it. I mean, know your levels, log on at some point. But if you can't log on on Tuesday because you're actually out drinking beer and surfing, then don't stress it. I mean, for goodness sake, don't stop your beer drinking just to go and check the market. <laughs> because it's not a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. If Monday was what everyone said it was, end of the world, you know what? Tuesday, we've got better prices. Wednesday, better, better still. And if you're a trader, I haven't touched on traders at all this evening because it's not the, 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 the ambit of this evening's presentation. But if you are a short-term trader, obey your stops. If you're trading derivatives or equities, 
Uh, you've got a process in mind, you've got an exit strategy which includes both exit at profit and at loss and when they get hit, you exit. Because you know that horrible little share that you have in your portfolio that you're going to go sell first thing tomorrow morning? How did you get it? Mm. You bought it on a trade, on a hot tip, it was going to make you rich in a hurry and it collapsed in a heap and you said, ooh, I'll make it a long-term investment. <laughs> I know that because I've been there, done that, got the scars. If you're a trader and it's going against you, get out. If it's going in your favor, take your profits. I mean, obey the system, whatever that system might be. So, know what we like, know where we like it. Ignore the noise, there will be a ton of it. Turn off the TV, especially the way the sharks play these days. Go and do important things like surf, red wine, read books, walk dogs, and let the market have its day. And certainly don't panic. And if you were stressed on Monday, interrogate why. Look at that portfolio, see what you're doing, what, what you could do better, what you can change, what, what caused you that level of stress. And, and I, I, I take the point that some of that stress, maybe all of that stress on Monday, may be due to lack of experience. If you're new to the market, Monday was a wild day. People were saying to me, worst day ever. It's like, well, no, <laughs> only if you haven't been in the market for, if you've been in the market for less than seven years, less than six years, yeah, worst day ever. If you've been in the market for more than six years, yeah, just another Monday. I'll take some questions. If you want individual stocks, that's fine. I will keep my answers to those short because we've got lots of people and tight on time. Uh, Christo Visa, so South Africa has an abundance of outstanding leaders. And I don't know if that, you know, maybe so does Brazil. I don't know, but that's, I'm not, I don't live in Brazil. We have an out, uh, 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 outstanding leaders. Christo Visa is up there with it. Um, the Stellenbosch Mafia, uh, we, we, and we use that politely. Uh, Christo Visa, Marcus Joester at, at Steinhoff, um, Yanni Maton, Rupert. Um, so Christo Visa, mostly Breit uh, and, and, and his vehicle. And what he's done, and if you look at the change of Breit from what it was in 2008 to what it is now and how he's done it, and if you look at what he's doing with the whole Frankfurt and, I mean, Comforama, you know, it's supposed to be the worst deal ever, except it's printing money. Um, you wouldn't know that Europe was struggling if you looked at, at him. So, yeah, it's a great point as well. It's leadership, eh? So who are these companies? I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's Kevin Hedewick. Um, it's, it's Whitey Besson. Um, it, it is leadership. Capitec's the one where the leadership's a bit grayer, but, but again, there's PSG behind it. And that brings some risk. That absolutely brings some risk to your outstanding companies. What you hope is that they have nurtured and, and, and new leaders will come through who will be as good or, or, or maybe better. Or, or, you know. But in many cases, it is leaders. Now, what will a great leader do is they will create that culture. They will create a business which will out-survive them. Indefinitely, maybe not. So the, the, the risk to them, I mean, it, it's in more at, 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 at Woolies. Um, great leaders make great, great, great businesses, outstanding businesses. And we have a lot of outstanding leaders in this country. Not in Parliament, but hey, that's Parliament for you. <laughs> so, I mean, you're 100% right. Sunset industry, we might have the minerals, but we can't get it, and that takes a lot with it. Manufacturing goes with it. Engineering goes with it as well. We need the replacement. I'm going to give... Two answers, one a little bit oblique. What you will note from a bunch of the companies I talk about, um, in fact, pretty much all of them, are two key themes, global or consumer. You know, famous brand is hamburgers, uh, Capitec, etc., ShopRite and Woolies. <clears throat> and in the case of the latter two, they've got aspirations into Australia, Africa, Richmond, a global business, Discovery becoming a global business. Um, sectors that are, so our consumer, our, our consumer companies, whether they be the retailers, whether they be the, the famous brands, whether they be Taste Holdings and, and, and Carla Gonzaga, um, we have got amazing leaders there. Uh, Woolies, return on equity is as good as you get globally. I mean, you know, just absolutely outstanding. The, the, the struggle we're going to have is can our consumer survive? Short answer, I think we will. There's, and, and what the problem is, is that we're going to have a 25% unemployed who really, really struggle. Um, and we're going to have that middle class who are going to do 
nicely enough. And then, of course, we're going to have, have the, the one percenters. Um, a space to be very good in is financial services. Uh, and, and financial services, I mean broadly, deal making, Marcus Yuster and the like. But, yeah, I mean, Sassfin, uh, uh, Ronald Sassoon run a really amazing operation. And a bank that you can occasionally pick up on a price to book of 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 which is crazy cheap, I mean, absolutely uh, uh, crazy cheap. But for me, my big point is consumerization, urbanization. Um, in South Africa, the risk, if anything, is, is the 25% unemployed, and it is a significant and real risk, um, and, and needs to be resolved. We can't carry on with it. We can, of course we can, but, but there is no upside to carrying on with it. So, so Imperial is interesting. Imperial predominantly logistics, some other bits and pieces and moving parts. Problem with logistics is they need a working economy. They need, they need GDP. They're, they're, they're basically a GDP play for them, otherwise they've got to steal uh, uh, market share. I don't like them because there's just too much beyond their control that they can't really particularly manage. Energy, absolutely, best player in that space is Consolidated Infrastructure Group, uh, Royal Gamsu. Um, they create green energy in South Africa, do they do uh, reticulation wires, they uh, electrify railways around through Africa, they've got their, their oil cleanup operations in Angola, and there's some issues, I mean, they, you know, there's some challenges that they've got, but they're probably our purest play in the energy space after Sassel. Um, and, and Sassel's an odd one because of the chemical business, but Consolidated Infrastructure Group, and they, they still, I mean, they, they're a small cap, maybe they're a mid cap. But uh, they're, they're a really good company with amazing leadership. And they, they used to be a hardware supplier, and they saw the problem with that and bought a little company called Conco, and now they are an energy company. I, hold, I bought my first Sassels in 1993-ish, uh, about 16 bucks a share or so. And my logic then, and for many years until I wrote, was that I hate commodities because of that that's supply and demand, and that's what they do. Price rallies, supply comes on, price crashes, supply goes off, price rallies. We get the occasional super cycle, but broadly that's the story. The, and I always said, but oil is different. This planet lives in oil. And with, with consumerization and urbanization, which is my big investment theme, we're going to see an increasing demand for oil. You know, transport, whether it be public transport, whether it be cars, and I get that cars become more efficient, but we're still going to see that increased demand for it. So I said, you know, ultimately, oil can break that sort of cyclical nature and, and, and sort of get a channel that goes higher. And I might have been wrong, and I might have been wrong for two key reasons. One is, is I mean, oil has it, has it. It goes down to 30, it goes to 120, it goes back to 30. It's not breaking that cyclical reason. The demand is there, but we're getting more efficient. And the bigger problem is the supply. So there's oil fields off the coast of Brazil that could be bigger than Saudi Arabia but they can't get to it until oil is $200. So if oil goes to $200, someone unplugs a hole, figuratively, not literally, unplugs a hole, and we've got another Saudi Arabia, and what does that do? Supply. So that's my problem with Sassel. The relief to it is in a brilliantly run company, some good management, which for decades they didn't have, and they're becoming very much a chemical business. They're trying to shift away from the oil and become the chemical business. I, at this point in time, am probably going to continue to hold them, but I have stopped buying them. And that's an important distinction. So I've got a list of shares I hold and buy. I've got a list of shares I hold and don't buy. List of shares I hold and don't buy. Sassel, Billiton, uh, Standard Bank, uh, currently MTN, probably others. But, but they're on the, I hold them, but I'm not convinced enough to buy them. I'm not stressed enough to sell them. Standard Bank, I will sell out because I've got Capitec. Take a last question. Yo. Uh, what do you think of the new listing signal? So signal is quite simple. It is going to pop like crazy. Uh, when it goes to IPO, get shares in IPO, it will, it, will, it will pop like crazy. Longer term, asset managers, yeah, they're a nice business. They make some nice margins. We've seen Coronation. We've seen Peregrine. Uh, we've seen KD. Some don't get it right. Signia will. Um, the, the lady, uh, Magda, I can't say her Polish surname, um, will we'll make that business go crazy. But the hype is going to be intense. Um, so get the IPO on, on Signia. Um, and I will do what I always do. I will sell on day one. And I will take 30 or 40% profit and think I'm brilliant. And then UX will sell on a week later and take 100% profit. And, and those numbers, I'm picking numbers. My style on that sort of thing is I buy on the, I sell on the, on the first day. 
and I take the pop. Signia will do. Longer term, probably good, but to me it's the quick money I want. It's not outstanding. Capitex outstanding. Ladies and gents, I'm going to leave it there because I've run my time. I will take more questions afterwards, but I want to uh, finish so that we can let people get to their places and, 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 and the like. And I'm going to, the, the video will be online uh, over the weekend. So I suppose the challenge is two things. Firstly, go home and look at the portfolio, see what you can do, see what you think should be there, see what you do like, see what you're not quite sure about. Um, and, and build that portfolio so that days like Monday are overcast days rather than black Mondays. Ladies and gents, thanks very much for your time this evening. <laughs>